All right, so a few years ago, I went to the cricket ground to watch cricket, Sydney Cricket Ground, and it was 40,000 people, and suddenly, boom, it happened. Three, two, one, poof, go, and the Mexican wave happened. Everyone stands up, arms go in the air, rubbish goes in the air, we all yell, we all cheer, and the wave goes round and round and round and round and round the crowd until it hits the members' stand, and they all sit there, in silence, and they do nothing. And that's where we as 40,000 people boo the members. Boo! And then the wave goes round again, round, 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 round. And it hits the members again. Again, silence. They sit there. They do nothing. And then we boo them again. Boo! And this happens over and over and over again. And then one day, a friend of mine who was a member invited me to the Sydney cricket ground. So I went as a member to watch the cricket. And then we're sitting there watching the cricket. And then it happened. The wave started. Three, two, one. And starts going round and round and round and round and round the crowd. And we're sitting there, the members, in panic, in fear. We're frozen. What's it going to do when it gets to us? And it's coming closer and closer and closer. And then it hits us in the members. We all sit there frozen, too scared to do anything. And there's silence. And suddenly 40,000 people start booing you. Boo, boo, boo. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's happened. I have become that guy. I'm the guy in the members that they are booing. Well, that's what it feels like for me right now to be here giving the missions talk. Because I once sat where you were going, oh, no, not the Easter talk. This happens every year. Every year we get the Easter talk. Well, now I'm that bozo here having to give the Easter talk. So before you go, boo, boo, get off. We don't want the Easter talk. Well, one day you might find yourself up here as well, hey, giving the Easter talk. So I am giving the Easter talk. And at this moment we all (sighs) roll our eyes. Not the Easter talk. But before we do that, just think. Right now, the Christian faith is booming all over the world. In Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, and in South America. People are loving, worshipping, and trusting Jesus. So they can see something in Jesus that we in the West have missed. So maybe today, let's rediscover the Jesus of the Bible. Forget about the Jesus we think we know. Forget about the Jesus we grew up with, and let's rediscover the Jesus the rest of the world is now knowing, loving, and worshipping. Now, I found this picture off the net, and I reckon if Jesus was around today, this is exactly what he'll look like. He'll be a short, nondescript, tanned, Middle Eastern male, uh, speaking Aramaic and Hebrew, walking around the countryside of Palestine. And I use this picture all the time to show what Jesus will look like today. And one day the guy is actually going to be here. Hey, that's my picture. You got it off the net. And I'm going, wow, it's Jesus. Jesus is really here. <laughs> but the story of Easter goes like this. God sent us his son, Jesus. He became one of us, did some amazing things when he was alive. More than that, died on a cross in our place. And he takes away all the sin, guilt, and shame in our life. More than that, he's alive I mean, we believe this. His spirit lives in us right now. One day he'll come again, set up a kingdom here on earth. So in the meantime, we have a mission to bring a little bit of Jesus on this planet, bring his love, mercy, and justice here. That's the Easter story. And if it's true, so what? Well, if it's true, Jesus answers our three deepest questions that we ask in life. The first question that we ask is this. Who am I? Like, really, who am I? When... We first moved to Australia. My dad bought this as our first ever family car. It's an E.H. Holden. It's very common. Back then, everyone had a Holden. It's what everyone was driving. It got you from point A to point B. But my dad saw value, beauty, and dignity in his car. So much so, he washed it, looked after it, and we weren't allowed to eat in his car. There was no way we were allowed to eat ice cream in his car. You think, but dad, what's the point of having a car if you can't even eat ice cream in your car? But dad saw value, beauty, dignity in his car, and dad was right. Because I just searched this week on carsales.com.au for an E.H. Holden. This is what you now have to pay for an E.H. Holden, $70,000. That's more than what I get paid by City Bible for in a year. This car is worth more than what I'm worth. So where does our value, beauty, and dignity come from? It's very hard to work out 
who we are. Where does our value come from? If we're just atoms and molecules, we're just another species of life on this planet, and there's so many of us, how are we special? You know, we can say you're special, I'm special, everyone's special, but everyone's special, we stop being special. And it's worse if you're Asian, because there aren't just a lot of us, <laughs> but we all look the same. <laughs> and then it was worse for me, because when I went to Trinity, in my class alone, my last name is Chan, there were four Chans in my year, so the teacher would mark the role in my class just going, Chan, 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 Chan. So you had to know which Chan you were and go, sir, at the right, mo right moment. You're so depersonalizing. It's so humiliating. But where does our value come from? If we're just atoms and molecules and just another species of life on this planet. These are the dating sites, Match.com and OkCupid. And a guy called Christian Rudder in his book called Dataclism, he's analysed what people click on. Not what they say they click on, but what they really do click on. And so if you go to one of these dating sites, and if you're an Asian male, a Caucasian female will be 33% less likely to click on you. A Hispanic woman will be 44% less likely to click on you. And an African-American woman will be 50% less likely to click on you. The worst thing you can be on a dating site is an Asian male. Actually, it's only the second worst thing. The worst thing you can be on, an Asian date, uh, on a dating site is a short Asian male. <laughs> That's a double deal breaker. So how do we find our value? Where do we find our beauty, our worth, our dignity if we're not that special? We find it from Jesus. Because at Easter, <laughs> he becomes one of us, a short, ordinary guy. He takes on our atoms and molecules. He becomes our species of life on this planet. He becomes one of us. He takes on our nose, our armpit hair, our pimples, and say, you're so special. I will become one of you. He gives us value, he gives us worth, he gives us dignity. So suddenly it doesn't matter what marks we get, what job we have, what position we have, what title we have. Jesus says, you are so special, I will become one of you. That's who we are. So special that Jesus becomes one of us. The second question that we're asking is this then. Well, why? Why am I here at all? So these are my three boys, Toby, Cooper, and Jonty. This is a typical night in our family. After dinner, they just go nuts. They run around. They're like puppy dogs. If you, th if you think the picture's blurred because the camera's blurred, no. It's just that they're always blurry. They're always moving, always moving. We can't stop them. So my wife and I, our mission every night is just to get them to go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. Because if we can get them asleep by 9 p.m., boom. We can watch Netflix. It's Netflix hour. It's everyone's dirty secret. Nine o'clock, everyone's on Netflix. It's why the internet is so slow. Everyone is on Netflix, Netflix hour. And it's not just Netflix hour. You know, for grown-ups, your parents, it's Netflix and red wine hour. <laughs> They're kicking back because when you kick in the Netflix and the red wine, oh, you can feel the cortisol levels just drop. But then I get what I call Netflix red wine mismatch because I will finish an episode of Netflix, but I still got half a glass of wine. So I've got to start another episode of Netflix. But then when I finish my glass of wine, I'm only halfway through the Netflix episode, so I've got to pour myself another glass of wine. Mm. And before you know it, it's midnight. And you think, I've just done it again. This is my life. How is this possible? So I said to the nurses at work, is this a bad thing? Is this a bad thing that every night I'm on Netflix? And they said, well, I don't know. Have you ever had the Netflix screen of shame? And I said, no, what's the Netflix screen of shame? I said, the Netflix screen of shame. They say, that is when you've been watching Netflix for so long, Netflix boom, kicks in and cuts out, and they give you the blank screen saying, are you still watching? And this moment, you have a blank, black screen, so you actually see yourself in the TV watching with a tub of ice cream in one hand and a bottle of red wine in the other, go, yes, I'm still watching. 
And you start thinking, is this my life? <laughs> but, you know, we can't blame ourselves because without Netflix, we would just be eating, sleeping, working every single day. At least now we're eating, sleeping, working and watching Netflix every day. So we've added value to our life. But at some point we go, why? Why am I here? Is this all I'm doing day to day? Is this what I'm going to do for the next 20 to 40 years of my life? Why am I here? If I'm just a random product, a blip in the timeline of the universe, maybe I don't have to be here. If I don't have to be here, maybe I don't belong here. If I don't belong here, maybe I'm just a nuisance. If I'm just a nuisance, maybe I need to get out the way. So we actually need to know why we're here, to know where we're going, so we know what we're looking for, we look for it, and find it, we will be fulfilled. So why are we here? Well, the Easter story says this, this is why we're here. We're part of God's plan, and God's plan is this. I loved you, I made you, I died for you, and I live for you, and you live for me as I live for you. So somehow everything we do, no matter how small, how mundane, is part of God's big plan for us. And that means even when we find ourselves doing something so tiny, so mundane, as my job is to put the cap on a toothpaste tube day after day, somehow this is part of Jesus' plan for this planet. Because somehow by you putting the toothpaste cap on the toothpaste tube, some will now have toothpaste. And because they now have toothpaste, they will brush their teeth. And because they brush their teeth, they won't get a cavity. And because they won't get a cavity, now they won't need root canal therapy. And now because they don't need root canal therapy, they've just saved $10,000. And because they've saved $10,000, they don't have to work so much. Because they don't have to work so much, now they can spend more time with their friends and family on the weekend. All because you put a cap on a toothpaste tube. It's all part of Jesus' plan for this planet. And maybe we ask the same question as we write our English essay again and again. Why am I writing an English essay? I haven't done the readings. No one's done the readings. This is, everyone's, this is No one's done the readings. The teacher hasn't done the readings. Why are we writing a book, 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 book that no one has ever read or will read? But here we are writing an English essay. Oh, why am I writing an essay? Why? Because it helped me to think. If it helps me to think, I'll be independent. If I'm, and if I'm independent, maybe I will travel. And if I can travel, maybe I can make a difference in this world. Somehow everything we do is part of Jesus' big plan for our life in this world. The third question we're asking is this. Well, what's my story? What is my story? Let me tell you about my friend Thomas. If I said to you, Thomas right now has a really bad cold, who here feels sorry for Thomas? Oh, well, it's a majority opinion. We're an empathetic crowd, very touchy-feely. It's all right to show feelings. We're all feeling sorry for Thomas, right? He's got a really bad cold. What if I said to you, Thomas has a really bad cold because last night he was playing Candy Crush on his phone all night. Who he now feels sorry for Thomas? Oh, the Candy Crush players, all right? Cool, cool, cool. But somehow I think, really? But what if I said to you, Thomas has a cold because he was up all night, assisting his wife give birth to their first ever child. Who he now feels sorry for Thomas. Whoa, okay, okay, okay. With it. Well, what's the difference? Because if he got sick just playing Candy Crush, we go, really, Thomas? Come on. That's so self-absorbed. It's so empty. It's so unfulfilling. But if he got sick bringing life into this world, wow, that is purposeful. You are serving someone else besides just yourself. And you've brought life into this world. That's rich. That's fulfilling. Where do we find meaning? Well, it all depends on what our story is. This is Viktor Frankl. He's a Holocaust survivor. And this is his book, Man's Search for Meaning. We're all searching for meaning. And Viktor Frankl says we find it when we live for someone else rather than just ourselves. When we find a story bigger than just our own story to live for. And that's what Jesus does. He comes and he becomes the ultimate someone else to live for. And he gives us the ultimate story to live for. Then the story is this. God loves us. God made us. God died for us. God lives for us. And we live for him as he lives for us. And because of that, we know who we are, why we're here, and what our story is. So what's that mean for us today? Well, a few weeks ago, my wife and I were shopping at Pitt Street Mall. 
but it was crowded, hot, and a Saturday. So my wife went into one of the shops to try on some clothes. So I went out of the shop and sat on a bench full of other men, and we're all on our phones. And I'm on my phone for 30 minutes, 60 minutes. We're all there waiting for our girlfriends and wives to finish shopping. And suddenly I get a text on my phone that says, can you come in and help me? So I come in, and my wife comes out, and she says, this is a green dress. What do you think of it? Does it look good on me? Wow. What do you think? Now, at that moment, I think, what do I think? I'm thinking Australia's playing South Africa in the cricket right now. I think I should have bought Bitcoin five years ago. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I should have saved up more money when I was younger. Now, she goes, no, no. Does this look good on me? And I went, wow. And I'm thinking, you did a Bachelor of Arts degree at Sydney University. You of all people should know from your philosophy classes that you are performing a category mistake right now because you're asking me to move from the world of facts, this is a green dress, to the world of values. Does this look good on me? And as we know, we cannot move from the world of is, atoms and molecules, to the world of values because what is good? What is better? How do you make that call? And if we're just atoms and molecules... If we're just another species of life on this planet, what is good? What is better? What is the good life? How can my life be better? That's a value judgment that we can only get if someone else comes into our life. And that's exactly what Jesus does in Easter. He comes into our life and he tells us what a good life is and what a better life is. And his story for us is this, that he loves us, he made us, he died for us, he lives for us, and we live for him as he lives for us. So what does that really mean for us? Well, just the other weekend, I was speaking at a church camp, and a high school boy asked me, how do I know if I am important? Because I don't feel important. And I knew the backstory to this guy's life. He studies hard, he wants to get good marks, but he, 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 no matter how much he studies, he's not going to get marks he wants. His father left him when he was young. He's being raised by his mother alone. He gets bullied at school. And he says, how do I know I'm important? Because people tell me I'm not important and I don't feel important. And I said, well, this is how you know you're important. God loves you. God made you. God died for you. God lives for you. And you live for him as he lives for you. And he said to me, but they're just words. You're just giving me words. And I said, you know what? You are so right. They are just words, because if there is no Easter, and if Jesus Christ never did come, they are just words. But because Easter really did happen, because Jesus really did come into our lives, they are more than words. They are based on Jesus, his actions, and they're based on Jesus' words. And Jesus' words for us today are these. I loved you, I made you, I died for you, and I live for you, and you live for me as I live for you. I'm going to hand you back now to Suli. He's going to sing us a song. Then I'm going to come up and share my story to you. And then Suli's going to sing another song. And then we'll open up to you guys for any question that you want to ask me. And I'll do my best to answer. Thanks. <laughs>